Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning here at Lighthouse Discipleship Center. My name is Dave Everett, and we're going to be continuing our, our, our study this morning on knowing the Holy Spirit. I think we're in part 15 this week, and uh, we probably have at least one, maybe two more weeks uh, of this left before we go to our new series. So uh, it's been a long series. It's always been long to teach a lot about the Holy Spirit and knowing the Holy Spirit. Uh, before I get into all all that, though, I just want to uh, let you know that all of our all of our teachings, all of our Bible studies, are archived on our website at lighthousediscipleship.org. <coughs> Excuse me, as, as well as our YouTube channel, Lighthouse Discipleship Center. And we thank you for all of our partners, financial partners, who have supported us financially through their ties and their offerings through our website at lighthousediscipleship.org. We also invite you to join us to our Bible study tonight that will be live streamed at 6 o'clock on Effortless Change by Andrew Womack, as well as our Bible study on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock on the Believer's Authority, also by Andrew Womack. So, without further ado, we're just going to go ahead and jump right on into our message this morning on knowing the Holy Spirit. So, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and show with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. This is our key verse that we've used to uh, launch this whole teaching series on knowing the Holy Spirit. <coughs> and uh, it's found here in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, it says, And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And then I've also been using the message translation in this particular passage and says, Amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. And the extravagant, extravagant love of God, the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And as I've been saying every single week for the last 15 weeks, you know, we talk a lot about knowing Jesus. We talk a lot about knowing God. This particular series, I'm highlighting knowing the Holy Spirit. Again, we talk a lot about the amazing grace of God. Of God. We talk a lot about knowing the, the extravagant love of the Father. But we want you to know the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit. Now, in this teaching series, we've also have highlighted the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, you can't talk about knowing the Holy Spirit without highlighting those uh, topics uh, that are, uh, go with it. But now, as we're kind of we're rounding third base, we're on the homeward stretch. I want to focus on the relationship of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to finish it. Uh, well, I also two weeks ago we took off last week for Easter uh, from our teaching series. We didn't take off, but we took off from our teaching series anyway. Um, well, now we're getting back. You know, we we talked about the oil and wine. We talked about the Holy Spirit as it relates to oil and wine. So I want to, since we had a, a week gap in between uh, where we left off on our 14th week and now we're in our 15th week, I want to do a little bit of recap on this oil and wine and then I want to conclude that section and then we're going to be on our homework stretch to again knowing the Holy Spirit and I'm going to bring, bring it, talk about the, the food of the Spirit and some other things along those lines. I don't know if I need one or two weeks on that yet or not. <coughs> so anyway, with that in mind, I, I mentioned two weeks ago that there's two major functions of the Holy Spirit. The first one is convicting the world of sin, or bringing us to salvation. That's the first and the primary function of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is bringing us all to a saving relationship with God <coughs> through Jesus Christ. The second major function of the Holy Spirit, we can talk about the gifts, we can talk about the baptism, we can talk about the fruit of the Spirit, but these are the two major functions. And the, the second major function of the Holy Spirit is baptizing believers with the Holy Spirit. Now, you can't be a believer unless you, you are believing, unless you receive Christ. But once you believe, the second major function of the Holy Spirit is baptizing those believers with the Holy Spirit. Okay? And with that, I've also... Uh, uh, in, in Luke chapter, let me give the reference here real quick. In Luke chapter 10, I think it is, yes. Luke chapter 10, 
we have what we call the parable of the Good Samaritan. Okay? And in that parable of the Good Samaritan, I'm, not, I'm going to I can do a fast track a recap of that. I'm not going to go detail by detail with that as I did before. But the, how did the whole parable of the Good Samaritan come about? It came about because a lawyer asked Jesus a question. And the question was, what must I do to be saved? Now, usually, you know, when a lawyer asks a question, there's usually a hidden agenda. There's, there's a, uh, maybe not a hidden agenda, but there's an agenda. <laughs> okay? And so, a lawyer asked Jesus a question, and what was the question? The question was, what must I do to be saved? That's how this whole conversation started. It started with a lawyer asking a question, what must I do to be saved? Jesus responds to that question, and he said, the answer is, love the Lord your God, and love your neighbor as yourself. That was the answer. That was the answer to that question. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So then the lawyer asked a second question. Who's my neighbor? If if, uh, if being saved means I have to love God and love my neighbor, we understand that part pretty well across the board, but then who's my neighbor? You know, we need to define that. So the lawyer, again, the lawyer with an agenda asked, who's my neighbor? He, he, was, he was great with the answer, if you read the passage in Luke, but he like, not lose my neighbor. And that's where Jesus responds with the, what we call the parable of the Good Samaritan. So there's two questions here. Who's, what must I do to be saved? And then the second question, who's my neighbor? Because loving my neighbor is part of the qualifications to being saved. Okay? Will you follow me so far? So let's, let's move forward with this. So then we have the parable of the Good Samaritan, again Luke chapter 10. And a certain man fell among thieves. He was stripped of his raiment, he was wounded, he was left uh, left for half dead, you know, and said that in Ephesians 2, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And I, and I relayed this whole story about we were the good Samaritan. We were the, excuse me, we were the man in the Jericho Road. We were the man who was, through Adam, when Adam sinned, we were stripped of our righteousness, raiment of righteousness. We were wounded. That's where sickness and disease and all other kinds of things, depression and all other kinds of mental and psych psychological problems began to happen. None of that was part of creation. None, all that came was part of a curse from the fall. And, Jesus, and Paul said in Galatians that we've been redeemed of the curse. And we were left for half dead. Jesus, God told Adam that when you eat of this tree, you will surely die. Now physically he lived 930 years, so he lived some time after, after the time of the fall until till he, he died naturally, but spiritually he, he died. And Ephesians 2 1 says that we were alienated from the life of God. The priest, and then the parable of the Good Samaritan talks about how the priest came by by chance. He, he, passed, he, he came by by chance, and then he passed by on the other side. Likewise, the Levite came by, and he also passed by. And I talked about how the, the, law, the law and the, the priest uh, could not help the man. The law can't help us. The law, they have one, one objective, and that is to reveal our sin. It's to reveal that we need a Savior. We can't save ourselves. The priest can't help us. The law can't help you. The priest can't help you. The only one who can help you is our neighbor. And, and that's Jesus. And we're going to get into that. And then we have in the parable of the, Samaritan, the, parable of the Good Samaritan. After the, after the priest came by and after the Levi came by, we have the Samaritan. And he came on a journey. Whereas the priest came by chance, and so did the Levi in the same manner, the Samaritan came on a journey. He, you know, uh, it, it, it was purposeful. He had compassion on the man. He bound up his wounds. He poured in oil and wine. He brought him into the inn, when I, which I related to the church. He departed uh, and gave two pence to the host, which I believe is the Holy, Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. And, and then when he said, when I come again, uh, I believe that speaks to the second coming. I'm not going to reteach all of this. This is just a recap of what we talked about two weeks ago. Okay? And then Jesus asked the lawyer a question. The lawyer had asked two questions. What must I do to be saved? And the second question is, who's my neighbor? So Jesus asked a, asked a, qu a question, which now of these three, which three? The three are, let me back up, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan. Which of these three? The priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan? It is, was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves. And yet, I don't know about you, through the years, I've always been taught the neighbor, 
was the guy in the road. We're supposed to, because he says go and do likewise. We think that we were supposed to go be neighbor to our friend. Now, I can give you a hundred of scripture how we should be neighbor. We should love one another. We should help one another. I can, I'm not taking away from that, 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 that message. But that doesn't fit the story. The story, the question was, it's a, it's a, it's a multiple choice question with multiple choice options. And the guy in the road is not a fourth option. Okay? Who was neighbor to him on Mount of Thieves? He, the guy in the road wasn't neighbor to himself. One of these three was neighbor to the one who fell on Thieves. And so, who was the one? It wasn't the priest, it wasn't the Levite, they passed by. And so, even the lawyer answered the question and says, him, the one <coughs> who showed him compassion, the one who was merciful to him. Verse 38, I think he says, he answers that. So, Jesus said, Go and do life. Again, the question was, who's my neighbor? In response to the question, what must I do to be saved? The neighbor was Jesus. Jesus found us in the Jericho Road. Jesus found us who was stripped, wounded, and left for half dead. And he came to give us life and life abundantly. Okay? That's the answer to this question. But going back to the story, verse 34. Again, I'm not reading the whole story. I'm going to highlight verse 34. So he... The good Samaritan went to him, the guy in the road, and bandaged his wound, pouring on <coughs> excuse me, oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. I've talked about the, every element of the story in two weeks ago, and I, I said that my main focus was to talk about this oil and wine, and we did start talking about that two weeks ago. Okay, so let's look at this little, again, let's go back to what I started off with two weeks ago and also this morning. There's two major functions of the Holy Spirit. We can talk about the gifts, we can talk about the vast of the Holy Spirit, we can talk a lot about our intimate friend, the Holy Spirit. But he has two main things. The first one is the oil, which speaks of, of the new birth, bringing us to Christ. It speaks to salvation, it's called the oil of salvation. And then the wine is talking about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Then going back to verse 34, he poured in him oil, salvation, and wine, the Holy Spirit. And then he brought him to the inn so that the innkeeper could take care of the host. Okay? Go forward. Now, we also talked about two weeks ago, cha uh, changing subjects a little bit here. We're still talking about this oil and wine. We went back to Pentecost. We went back to Acts chapter 2, where, where they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And some of the other people who were in town, because of the, the Feast of Pe Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, was, was there, so a lot of foreigners were in town. <coughs> and they heard, as, as the, the, the 120 who were in the upper room began to speak in tongues, not just the apostles, but the 120, they began to hear, these foreigners began to hear them speak in their own language. Some people received it, thought it was, 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 was awed by it, but some people also criticized and said, these people are drunk. Peter stood up, addressing that drunken comment, that remark, <coughs> excuse me, and he said, these people are not drunk. And he began to preach from the book of Joel. And Joel, he started with verse 28 and went to almost 30, verse 32. And we began to pick, and so with that in context, talking about the Holy Spirit, which we're talking about, I said, let's go back to the book of Joel. And let's get the context of what Joel was talking about. And so we picked it up in verse 23. Peter started quoting in Acts 2, verse 28, but we're going to pick it up verse 23. It says, Be glad then, you children of Zion. That's the church, that's the bride of Christ. And rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you. <coughs> Excuse me. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall be overflowed with new wine. We're wine and oil. We're going to come back to verse 24. 
So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall be never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. So, uh, that, that's, uh, there's more to the story, and that's where Peter picks up verse 28 all the way to verse 32, and I'm not going to reteach all that this morning. There's a lot here that, that I taught two weeks ago, but I want to go back to verse 24. And that's where we were two weeks ago. It says, The threshing floor shall be full of wheat, and the vat shall overflow with new wine and oil. This wine and oil was in the Good Samaritan story, but Peter, on Pentecost, quoted from Joel chapter 2. And in the context of that, we see this wine and oil once again. And that the threshing floor shall be full of wheat, and the what fats overflow with the wine. There's a lot of symbolism in prophecy, especially Old Testament prophecy. And the floor speak of the earth. We can see that in Isaiah 66 1, where the earth is his footstool. Um, the wheat it speaks of harvest, that's very repetitive, even in the Gospels. And that, that the bats are vessels. The oil is the way again the working of the new birth that we've already established. And the wine is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And the scripture says that these threshing floors shall be full of wheat. How many know the harvest is ripe? And the main function of the Holy Spirit is to gather this harvest and get them saved. And the bats, these vessels, are full, overflowing with oil and wine, or wine and oil. Okay? And so, as God has filled us. You know, you can't receive the wine until you receive the oil. You can't get the Holy Spirit until you have the oil. And you can't you can't win the loss until you have the oil and the wine. <laughs> you need Jesus and you need the Holy Spirit if you're going to be effective reaching the loss. Because the two main functions of the Holy Spirit is to, to get the, the win the loss and to fill them with the Holy Spirit. And you can't, as a vessel, you can't overflow with new wine until you have the wine and the oil yourself. Okay? Uh, anyway, uh, let's go forward just a little bit. We also went to Psalm 104, verses 13 and 15 uh, two weeks ago. And, he, he, and uh, let's pick up verse 13. And he, he waters, sorry, I must have missed something here. Water, waters the hill from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your works. And he causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the service of man that he may bring for food from the earth, and wine that makes glad the heart of man, something out of balance there. Okay? Again, there's two major functions of the Holy Spirit. Now, everything I'm doing right now is recap from two weeks ago. The loss, the first one is the loss to get his oil in you, to get you saved. That's the first and primary focus of the Holy Spirit. We can never lose that. It's not... The first, the first one is not to get you filled with the Holy Spirit. The first one is to get you saved. Because you can't go to heaven without salvation. And you can't have the wine without salvation. So the first one is always going to be the loss. The gifts that we've been talking about. Tongues that we've been talking about. Everything we've been talking about. The first primary function of the Holy Spirit is always the loss. It's not about so we can have our own circus. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying if we are in a, in a, in a room with, with those who are saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, we can have a good time in, with the wine. Okay? Done decently in an order, but we can have a good time with the wine. But when we get carried away with the wine and there's people who are lost in the room, we need to be considerate. Okay? We need to get them on board. Because the, the focus is not to have a wine party. The focus is to see people get saved. Okay? And so, and then the second bunch is believers to get the wine in you. To, why? Why do we need the wine in, in us? To lead us and to guide us into all truth. John 16, 13. And John 16, 13 says, However, when he... The Spirit of Truth has come. He will guide you into all truth. 
For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. We need the oil to get saved, but we need the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us into all truth. Jesus talked, and just before he went to the cross, Jesus spent three chapters, John 14, 15, and 16, just before he goes to the cross, talking about the Holy Spirit. And one of the things he focused on in verse six, chapter 16, verse 13, is that he, when the Holy Spirit will come, will guide us into all truth. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. If you, if you don't let the Holy Spirit guide you in all truth, you can be saved, but also immature. And I want to become mature. I want to become guided into all truth. True. And, and, and I've been to some churches, I've been around some believers, that have been Christians for years, and I understand if you're a newbie, you're gonna, you need some time to get guided. God called us to make disciples of all nations. Discipleship takes a little bit of time to at least get started. Discipleship is a lifestyle. It's not, it's not just three years you're graduating and then you're, you're fully trained. You, you will be discipled until Jesus comes. At the same point in time, we need the Holy Spirit to guide us all truth. But there's some people, they've been converted, they've received the oil, but there's been no guidance. And they're out of control, there's immaturity. And I'm not speaking not to put people down. I'm just classifying it to a certain degree that we need to grow up into him in all things. There needs to be maturity, and that's a process. You can't get that overnight. You can't get that with a little bit of oil. You, you can't even get started without the oil, but you need the oil. But you need the wine, too, to, to, to be guided into all truth. Am I making sense? Okay? Going back to the Good Samaritan, I relate this to myself, and as I relate to myself, I relate it to you. I was lost. I was stripped. I was wounded and half dead until Jesus found me. I didn't find God. I didn't find Jesus. He wasn't lost. I was. I, he wasn't wounded. He wasn't stripped. He wasn't half dead. I was. <coughs> God found me, and my neighbor, Jesus, found me. He gave me the overflowing oil of salvation. He gave me the overflowing wine of his spirit. He restored to me the years of the locusts, the, can, the, 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 the crawling locusts, and the, the swarming locusts, and all the different locusts. Everything the enemy has destroyed for me, he's restored to me the years. And he's guided me. My friend, my intimate friend, the Holy Spirit, has guided me into all truth. I don't know about you, but I love that. This is awesome. Okay? Again, to the two major functions of the Holy Spirit, it's in the Again, get the lost, get the oil needed to get you saved, and believe in the guide you into all truth. And then we looked at the ten virgins, briefly in Matthew 25, and we have five wise, wise virgins and five foolish, foolish virgins. And the main difference was the wise ones had oil, and the five foolish ones had no oil. Again, oil being salvation. Oil was required, but the wine was not even mentioned. Okay? I believe in the wine in regards to the Holy Spirit. But in this parable, <coughs> what's required? You don't, and we've been talking all along. You do not have to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You get to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And as Andrew Womack would teach, you might even get to heaven quicker without the guidance of your friend, the Holy Spirit. Okay? But at the same point in time, the oil is essential. The wine. <coughs> the wine is also essential, but not for salvation. Okay? If you're going to be mature, you cannot... It's, I've never seen what I consider a mature Christian without the Holy Spirit. Okay? I'm not, and that's not, that's not a put down. That's not my intention. I don't know about you, but I want all that God has for me. Not just one aspect or not just a little. Okay? Isaiah 20. Now I go to some new territory. We haven't gone here yet. So in Isaiah chapter 28, and we're going to spend a little bit of time here. So this is all new territory. Everything we talked about so far was basically recap. So let me just catch up with myself here in my notes. And Isaiah 28. 
So we're going to read about eight verses here, uh, 12 in all. And so let, and just bear with me as we read this. Well to the crowd of pride, I mean uh, to, to the drunkard of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is fading, flower which is the head of the virgin, valley to those who are overflow with wine. Behold, the Lord has a mighty and strong one, like and a mighty strong one, like a tempest of the hell and destroying storm, like a flood of mighty waters overflowing, who will bring them down to the earth with the sand? The crowd of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, will be trampled under the foot. And the glorious beauty is fading is a faded flower, which is at the head of the verdant valley, like the first fruit before the summer, which an overseer sees. He eats it up while it's still in his hand. In that day, the Lord of hosts will be a, for a crown of glory. We have the crown of pride versus the crown of glory. Not a major point, but just a little side point. And a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people, for a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment, and for strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. Verse 7. Uh, I'm missing... I got six here. Okay. Verse 7. But they also have erred through wine and through the intoxicating drink, are out of the way. And the priest and the prophet have erred through the intoxicating drink. They are swallowed up by wine, and they are out of the way through intoxicating drink. They err in vision, and they stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filth, and no place is clean. Now that's a very bleak picture. Eight times in this, in these eight verses, we see wine, intoxicated drink, or some drunkenness, or whatnot. Okay, it's a bleak picture. Bear with me. There's a reason why we're going here. Okay, and I know when we talk about vomit. This is not necessarily something you want to to talk about on Sunday morning or any time for that matter. I say for any time. It's scripture, and it, it you know, tied into what we're going to talk about: wine and oil, and the Holy, knowing the Holy Spirit. Okay. Again, this is a very bleak picture. A sloppy drunkards who are vomiting. They're, and at the end of verse eight, uh, 7, it says they err in vision, they stumble in judgment. Okay? That's a bit bleak picture of a drunkard. Their vision is impaired, and their judgment has left them. Okay? That's a bleak picture. Okay? Now, poor judgment. Let me just speak about these two things real quick. Poor judgment and poor vision. <coughs> How many of you would agree with me? Poor judgment is not knowing right and wrong. For example, abortion, homosexuality, and other many other things. Not knowing if you're a boy or a girl. That is poor vision, okay? Uh, uh, poor judgment. <laughs> poor vision is also not knowing the kingdom of God is here. Healing is here. The Spirit of God is here. That's also poor judgment and poor vision, okay? I'll come back to some of that. But people everywhere in the world, and even in places in the church. They are drunk on the world. They're drunk on the news. They're drunk on politics. <coughs> They're drunk on philosophy and humanism. They're drunk on the political correctness. And they're drunk on the media. Uh, and I can, the list can go on. This is just a few things I've highlighted that are very prevalent even right now. People are just drunk with the cares of this world. And there's many scriptures that warn us from doing that. And then, excuse me, I got, got my little clicker, my, my, it gets the best of me sometimes. You can get so intoxicated with the things of the world that your judgment is erred and your vision is impaired. I mean, and and let's, just take, let's just take the, the things of the world going on right now. Let's just say you are going through a tragedy, a crisis in your family or in your life. You get a doctor's report. Or there's an accident, some tragedy. You can get so intoxicated with the problem that your judgment can become aired and your vision can become impaired in the moment. Okay? There's so many different things that we can talk about. Maybe you had a fight. Maybe you had a divorce. Maybe you had, uh, you know, um, maybe you got laid off, you know, lost your job or you got fired. Whatever the, circum the circumstance could be, maybe you got a doctor's report, you got cancer, you got two, two weeks to live or two months to live or whatever the case may be. There, you, or, what, or there could be a lot of different circumstances. You can be in the, in the crisis of your life. You can be like Job and you're just getting it all, from all angles. And you can be so intoxicated with the problem 
that your judgment can become error and your vision can become impaired. Maybe you have an addiction and you're just, you're wasting your life. You, you really, and a lot of the problems are going on because you made a mistake. Or maybe, maybe you got violated in, in, in a horrific way. And you are just ruined in so many different ways because of, of what has happened to you. You can be so intoxicated from being a victim, so intoxicated by the problem. And I'm, not, I'm not trying to minimize what you've gone through. That's not why I'm getting that. But you can get so intoxicated with it that your judgment becomes aired and your vision becomes impaired. There's so many different scenarios I can throw out here. And, I, and some of you, maybe everything I mentioned, hell, all that's happening right now. Can you imagine how the temptation and the, 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 the vulnerability to becoming so intoxicated with all of life's problems, even if it's horrible? And I'm not, again, I'm not trying to be in, uh, minimize it and talk it in this way. But even then, your judgment can become aired and your your vision can become impaired. Okay? But then he picks up verse 9. We read the first eight verses so far. Verse 9, it says, Whom will he teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk. Those just drawn from the breast. For a precept must be upon a precept, and precept upon precept, line upon line, and line upon line, here a little, and there a little. For with a stammering lips and another tongue he will speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest with which you will make cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Paul quotes here, uh, in, 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 in the New Testament, he quotes here, because this, this is talking about the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues specifically. The rest and the refreshing. Andrew Womack has taught on this. Others have taught on this. I have taught from this verse. about. Actually, when we, when we were talking about tongues, we came to this verse, verse 12, in Isaiah 20, chapter 28. This is a refresh. This is a refreshing. You've got eight verses talking about all this drunkenness and, and whatnot, and then you got this. And, why, and, and then the question is, why eight verses about drunkenness? And then, by the way, I have a rest and refreshing for my people. He was connecting wine and drunkenness with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and them, their other tongues that some people have a problem with. Okay? He was connecting these things. Okay? People would, let me paint a picture. People would rather go the way of the world than the way of God many times. People would rather build their own kingdom than to build the kingdom of God in the strength and power of the Holy Spirit. Some people want to do what God's called them to do, but in their own strength, in their own power, instead of the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to, I'm, I'm, again, as I mentioned already, we're rounding third base and taking it home. I'm going to be talking about from Acts chapter 1, verse 8, in the next couple of weeks, about how the Spirit of the, that we shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. <laughs> and I'm going to take everything we've been talking about the last 15 weeks, the gifts and different things, and, the, and be talking about the fruits of the Spirit and how we are to be a witness. And we are supposed to do things how the Holy Spirit would lead us, not how our flesh wants to do it. With the two main functions of the Holy Spirit, winning the loss and bringing people to the baptism of our intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. We are to be a witness, and we are here to build the kingdom of God, not our own kingdom. And we can get so intoxicated in this world in these last days. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of junk. There's a lot of evil. There's a lot of division. There's a lot of different things going on. And we can get so intoxicated with that stuff that we are ineffective. And winning people to the Lord and bring people to our intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. And, and so we can either build our kingdom and worry about us four no more. Or we can, we can be filled with the Holy Spirit despite what's going on in our lives, despite what's going on in our world. And we can reach the world and with the kingdom of God who is in us. The Spirit of God who has filled us to heal the sick and set the captives free. Okay? People would rather seek rest and refuge in the world through drunkenness, drugs, alcohol, yoga, the third eye, and other things that I could talk about, than be filled with the Holy Spirit, the rest and the refreshing. 
It's going to be hard for you to win the world when you are intoxicated and you're falling apart. But there's a, despite what's going on in the world, despite all the, the drunkenness and vomit and different things of the world, we can, there's a rest and there's a refreshing for the people of God. It's awesome. It starts out with a bleak picture because we live in a bleak world. <laughs> and some of our lives are bleak. But it's time to rise up, church. And come into the rest and refreshing that God has for us. And I'm, I'm still going to bring this all back to oil and wine here in just a moment. In Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, it says, And, you do, and do not be drunk with wine, in which is this is dispensation, but be filled with the Spirit. <coughs> Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. We're not supposed to be drunk like the world. And I'm not just talking about alcohol. There's a lot of drunkenness going on on Facebook and different things right now in the news about the things going on in the world. And there is a lot to talk about. There's a lot of things. I mean, I read a Facebook post today about has anyone tried to unplug the USA and plug it back in to see if it's going to work again? <laughs> you know, just sometimes when you have an appliance and it doesn't work, you unplug it and plug it back in. I, my computer was messing up this week. I just rebooted it and it started working fine. Sometimes we, some of other things in the world and we just need to unplug it and try to plug it back in. And I'm being facetious right now, but at the same point in time, there's a lot of just junk and garbage going on in our world right now. But we, are the church of Jesus Christ, Zion, we are different. We're not going to be drunk with the world, with the world we are going to be filled with the Spirit of God, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in the hearts of the Lord. We can be like Paul and Silas in the deepest part of the dungeon and we're going to worship God and the jail is going to, there's going to be an earthquake and we can win the jailer and his family to Jesus Christ, which is the first and primary purpose of the Holy Spirit, to win the loss. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Now, I want to switch gears here for a moment. And I've been talking about a lot about oil and wine. And I'm still talking about that briefly. But I want to go off on that just for a moment. And I want to compare a well, W-E-L-L, -L, with a river. And how it relates to the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus talks about the well in John 4, and he talks about a river in John 7. Okay, let me look at it. I'm not going to read the whole story, but this is the story of Jesus and the, and the Samaritan woman, okay? The woman at the well. <coughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to just take extracts from this. But in verse 10, he says, Jesus answered and said to her, this is Samaritan at the well, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. I got to pick up verse 13. It says, Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. I'm reading from the New King James. The King James calls this a well, a fountain of water, a well. It, it says, again, um, whoever drinks of his water will become in him a, a well, a fountain of water. Whoever or whosoever or anybody, anybody can have a well. Anybody can have a well in them, which is Jesus Christ, springing to everlasting life. Are you following me so far? Anybody can do that. Because I don't know about you, whoever means whoever. Nobody is excluded. Okay? Whoever drinks the water Jesus gives shall be in him a well of living water. The well of life that springs up to everlasting life. And it's for everyone. Anyone can get a well. Okay? I'm switching. We were talking about oil and wine. Switch the, the oil with well and switch the wine to a river in just a moment. Okay? <coughs> John 7.37 Three chapters later, Jesus is talking to his disciples and others. He says, in the last days, 
that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried and said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believeth on me, that, the other one was whoever. This one is he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spake of the Holy Spirit, which they, they believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. He's, he talked about this before the cross. He talked about this before Pentecost. That's why this, this, this uh, parenthetical phrase, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but uh, this, this, this parenthesis here, he, he, he added that clause there, the writer John, because uh, Jesus had not yet been glorified. But he was speaking of the Holy Spirit. Where anyone can come and he will put a well in you. John chapter 4. Anyone can receive Jesus, the oil, the oil of salvation. Um, and, and, and the well springing up into everlasting life. Okay? Even jo Isaiah 12, 3, we've talked about this before, there will be joy, there with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Okay? This well speaks of salvation. But anyone can come and have a well. But whoever believes in him, John 7, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. There's a difference between a well and a river. Okay? Proverbs even, I'm speaking to this, this, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water, but in Proverbs 20, 27, in the King James, the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. That's just a little side verse talking about this little the belly. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. There's actually a proverb talking about that. There's a difference between whosoever and the believer. And there's a difference between a well and a river. Okay? A well, anyone can have a well. It's personal. It's for personal edification. It's your personal walk with God. It's your personal salvation. I can't get saved for you. Your family, your spouse, your parents, your, your children can't get saved for you. You have to have your own well. Okay? It's your own walk with God. But a river is for the city. It's for the, the world. It's for the community. Okay? The, the oil of salvation is for your own salvation. But the river, the wine, is for the people. To be a witness to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. Am I making sense so far? Okay, we're just using different analogies. We're still talking about oil and wine, but now we're talking about wells and river. Same Analogy, just different, uh, different analogy. Does that make sense? Okay. Well versus river. You don't build high power electrical plants by wells. Edison, whatever electrical company you have near you, they don't build high power electrical plants near rivers. I mean, near, near, near wells. They do it near, near rivers. Okay. A well, which speaks of the new birth, just like the oil, is my own eternal security. But a river, speaking of the Holy Spirit, speaking of the wine, is a power to be a witness into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Acts 1-8, which we're eventually going to get into in the next couple of weeks. Most people thought I was going to start here. <laughs> I'm going to end here. Okay? Am I making sense? We need a well. We all need a well. But if we're going to be effective in reaching our world, we need a river. And that's the Holy Spirit. Okay? John 14, 15 through 17. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. That's speaking of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. That he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth from the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him not. But ye know him, for he dwelleth in you, and shall be in you, and, and shall be in you. Sorry, I didn't know I was done. <laughs> this Holy Spirit, this river, this wine that we've been talking about, is it, 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 you are a vat, you are a vessel that's overflowing with new wine. 
The world cannot know him because it hasn't received the oil yet. It hasn't had a well yet. But you have the oil of salvation. You have the, uh, you have the, the well of salvation that we just read about in Isaiah. And so you have the wine. And you have the river. And you do know him. And we're talking about knowing the Holy Spirit. That's what this whole series is about. You do know him. For he dwelleth in you. And he shall be in you. You do know him. And if you do not know him, we're, we've been introducing to him in the last 15 weeks. And we're not done with this. Okay? And he's the spirit of the truth. The world can't know him. I know there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now. But the spirit of God that the world does not know is in you. And he's your friend called the Holy Spirit. It's, and it's a river. It's wine. And it's something the world does not have. The world cannot know. The world can't understand. And the world cannot take it away. Okay? Okay? There is a ministry of the Holy Spirit that the world cannot receive. John 16, I'm not going to speak all of this right now, but he convicts the world of sin. He's bringing the world, his, his job, his first major role of the Holy Spirit is to bring people to a saving relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so his first purpose is to bring the world to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. It says in John 16, 8-11 I'm just going to turn here real quick and I'm going to go back to that slide. And when He, the Holy Spirit has come let me just say this, I probably, I've said this before in the series, but how many know the Holy Spirit is not an it, it's, it's a He He's a person. And when He has come He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. That's the oil. That's the well. Of righteousness because I go to my Father. And you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judge. The Holy Spirit's job. I talk about two purposes. There's three purposes mentioned here. The Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin because they do not believe. They don't have the oil. They don't have the, they don't have the well yet. But uh, to us who do have the oil, to us who uh, thus we do have, uh, who are saved, of righteous, we need to know that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And then we also need to be reminded that the enemy is already judge. He is judge. He needs to be reminded, and we have the authority to remind him. <laughs> okay? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, one of the primary, there's a ministry in the Holy Spirit that the world cannot receive. Because they first need to be convicted of sin and receive Jesus Christ. Receive the oil. He convicts the believers of righteousness. <coughs> but he gives the believers a new spirit. What's a new spirit? Romans 8, 9 and 10 says, But ye, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead <coughs> because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Your body may be dead because of sin, but your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Going back real quick, that's why the Holy Spirit convicts you of righteousness. You are dead to sin, but alive to God because of righteousness. That's a whole other teaching. And I've taught on this many times, and, I, and I'm probably going to get ready to teach on some of this again about righteousness. But righteousness, you know, when we first started this church almost seven years ago, I spent a whole year talking about righteousness. You, talk, you think this series is long? That was a long series, okay? But uh, well, since we're here, uh, he also, he puts a new spirit in you. The spirit of Christ. 
He gives you a new spirit. He gives you a, a well. He gives you the oil of salvation. The, uh, he gives you a new spirit. And we're going to talk about that briefly here in just a second. Okay? You cannot have this wine, though. You can't have this river until you first have the oil of the well. It's for believers only. The wine is for believers only. You can't get to heaven without the oil. You can get to heaven without the wine. But you can't have the wine until you have the oil. You can't get to know the Holy Spirit. That I just said that he said the world does not know him. You can't get to know the Holy Spirit. We're talking about knowing the Holy Spirit, but you can't know the Holy Spirit until you first know Jesus. But the Holy Spirit's role is to bring you to Jesus. So you can know Jesus. And once you get to know Jesus, the Holy Spirit wants to say, let me introduce you to myself. You might be a friend, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to first introduce you to Jesus, your Savior. You're the extravagant love of God. But then he, after you have the oil, after you have a well, springing to everlasting life, he wants to introduce you to himself. You thought the well was good. Let me show you the river. You thought the oil was good. Let me show you now the wine. We can't go into we can't have the wine until we have the oil. But if we have the oil church, we can't have our if our vast might be overflowing with oil. But he says that in these last days our vast will be overflowing with oil and wine. Okay? It's like a river. Flowing with living water. That's awesome. Okay? This is Joel chapter 2 when he talks about this vast. It's talk, it was where Peter preaches about in these last days. His spirit wants to overflow in you oil and wine. Okay? Many people want the joy. Many people want the power. Acts 8, power. You should receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. But they don't want to get right with God. They don't want the oil of salvation. In some ways, they're like they're like Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter six, eight, excuse me, where uh, uh, Philip went to Samaria and he had a revival in Samaria, and Peter and John and the, the apostles came and they received the Holy Spirit. <coughs> and Simon the sorcerer saw the power, but he he wanted to buy it for his own selfish reasons. He didn't want to get right with God. And, and Peter rebuked him. Peter addressed that. I want the power and I want the joy. Because we have a, a, jo a, a oil of joy, a well of that. And I want the power. I want the mighty power river. I want that wine. But that never replaces getting right with God and having oil of salvation. You can't have the power. You can't have the joy. You can't have the fruit of the Spirit, in, in a sense, without the oil, without the well, without salvation. But once you do have it, you can have the power. You can have the joy. And it's not the power of the world. It's the power of the Spirit of the living God. The world will make you drunk. The world will, will impair your vision. The world will air your judgment. But there's a rest and there's a refreshing for the people of God. And it looks like stammering lips. It looks like drunkard people. But it's the power of God. And I painted, uh, I wish, I, I don't, one thing about using a PowerPoint, I can go back to these slides. But it, there's some other verses in Joel chapter 2 that talk about you should be satisfied with plenty. God's going to restore all the years of wasting the loss. There's a restoration coming. There's a revival coming. There's a power coming. And uh, he goes on. He's, uh, he's going to pour out his spirit, his wine upon all flesh. You're going to see visions and dream dreams. His spirit and God is going to be upon you. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 to 17, Jesus and then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. 
No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put a new wine in old wineskins, or else the wineskins break and the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Okay? So we're, we're still talking about this oil and wine, but I'm, I bring that passage out in Matthew chapter 9 where the religious people were asking, how come your, how come your disciples are not fasting like we do? You know, what, what's, what's up with that? And Jesus, Jesus said, again, this is before the cross. Jesus is with them in the flesh. And he's asking, well, what the, when the bridegroom's here, they're not going to fast. But there's a day coming where they will fast. Okay? But then he, he talked about, no one puts a, he gives two, two analogies. First, is putting an unshrunk cloth on a, 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 a patch, on a garment. And he said, well, if you do that, uh, you, you're going to make the tear worse. I like, I like the second analogy better, but he says, you don't put new wine in old wineskins. Otherwise, you're going to ruin both the wineskin and the wine. Okay? There's two, what, is, what is he talking about here? There's two different covenants. We have the old covenant, and we have the new covenant. Okay? You cannot mix Old Testament law with New Testament grace. Am I saying the Old Testament is raw? No. Actually, when Paul preached on this, Type of, when Paul preached this way, people came to him, are you saying the law is bad? No. But that should, if we don't preach grace in a certain way, that question, let me rephrase what I want to say. If, when we preach grace, the question is, are we saying the law is bad, doesn't come up, then we have not preached grace the way God, Paul did. The obvious answer and the, the resounding answer Paul always gives, the law is good. The law is holy. I'm paraphrasing right now. The law is good. The law is holy. God's not, we're not abolishing the law. At the same point in time, we can't mix the law with grace. We are in the new covenant. The law is holy, but the law can't make you holy. The law is good, but the law can't make you good. There's only one thing that can make you holy. There's only one thing that can make you good, and that is the blood of Jesus. All, what Jesus did can make you holy. Believing on what Jesus did can make you holy and good. But now that you are holy and you are good because you received Jesus, then act like who you are. If you are holy... Then act like a holy person. Act like a godly person. You know, the law that can't make you holy and good, but now that you're holy and good through Jesus Christ, you still don't commit murder. You still don't commit adultery. You still don't lie and cheat and bear false witness, etc. Okay? You don't become holy and good because you keep those commandments, but you also, now that you are holy, doesn't mean you just live, live like an animal. Okay? We live holy and good because we are holy and good through Jesus Christ. Paul said this way in Ephesians chapter 4, that we put off the old man in the spirit of our mind, we put on the new man who's created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. We are created according to God in true righteous holiness. But you cannot mix Old Testament law with New Testament grace. The Old Testament brought you to Christ. But once you receive Christ, you put on you put the oil away and the new wine and new wineskins. I mean, I talked talk a little bit about this last week about, with Easter, but we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And that new creation is the new wineskins. And we put that new wine in the new wineskins. We, we are new creations, but we don't, now that we're new wineskins, we don't live under the law, we live under the wine, the grace. We still don't, we still the law is still good and holy, but the law was to point out you were a sinner. The, the law, uh, the law brought you to Christ. But once you receive Christ, the oil, the well, you don't need the tutor anymore. Paul talks about this in Galatians chapter 3. But you put the new wine in new wineskins. 
In other words, the loss cannot contain the, the wine. Why? Because it doesn't have the oil yet. It doesn't even have the new wine skins. It can't contain it. It can't receive it. But once you get them saved, you get them new wine skins, and they can be filled with that wine. Okay? But stop trying to, to push the Holy Spirit, the gifts, onto someone who hasn't received the oil yet, who hasn't had new wine skins on him yet. No, they need to be saved first. And once they're saved, now they can contain the wine. Am I making sense? Okay, there's much, much more I can bring out of this. Uh, but, you know, but sometimes we, 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 we try to, we're new wine skins, but we're still trying to live the, the old way and our new old covenant. It won't work. It doesn't work. It's a whole new covenant. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And we are in a different dispensation. We are under a different covenant. And, uh, and because why? We receive Jesus Christ. We receive the oil of salvation. Okay? And he's here to restore the years that we lost. Okay? Oil and wine. Oil, see, oil renews. I, I've never worked with a saddle. I haven't worked with oil in this sense, but I've, I've read, I did some reading this in the last couple of weeks, but sometimes if you have a saddle and the, the leather is all stiff and hard, you put some oil in that thing. Rub it in and do it properly, and I don't know all the proper ways to do that, but you can make that soft and, and then work it again. I have done it to a certain degree in a baseball bit. It's made out of leather, and I've done that with some oil and make it soft. I have lately, uh, uh, because we have some new patio furniture that was given to us, and I have been teaking it with some teak oil <laughs> to, to, to make the, 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 the wood uh, and keep it, and to preserve it. But oil renews, that's the point, it makes it workable again. And some people, you already have the oil in the sense that you're saved. But some of you, need, you need to be renewed. You need, you need to get that leather, you need to put that oil in that old saddle again. You cannot receive the fullness of the Spirit until you become born again. And some of you can't function in the power of the Holy Spirit until you get that oil working in that, that saddle again, so to speak. that making sense? Come back to His first love. Come back to the love of God. Come back and be renewed by the oil of your salvation. Now, get that well working again. In a matter of time, we can see the fullness of the Spirit working in our life. Okay? Where bats are overflowing with oil and wine. And just because we're, we're in a new covenant, we're in a new, we're in a new covenant, and we're focusing on the wine, so to speak, because we already have the oil, just because we want the oil to overflow, we still want the oil. We, we, excuse me, I got so excited, I got ahead of myself. We want the wine to overflow, the power, the river, but we still want the oil to overflow too. We don't want to be all wine and no oil. It'll make us goofy. It'll make us sad, sick. We still want our vats overflowing with oil and wine. We need to be renewed day by day from glory to glory, from grace to grace, from faith to faith. It, the oil never gets old. The oil renews. You can get so caught up in the wine that now you do become acting like a drunk when your vision becomes impaired and your judgment becomes aired. We want the wine, but we never want to stop the oil. We want both. We need the oil and the wine. And the Good Samaritan, Jesus, our Good Samaritan, poured into the man in the Jericho road that was stripped, wounded, and left out had that oil and wine, the two main functions of the Holy Spirit. He's our guide. He will renew us. He'll bring the scriptures to renew us. He'll always bring us to a room. Even though we are, so as our saved, we still need oil. It's not like you got the oil one time, I don't need oil no more. No. You try doing that in your car to put, keep one oil on there, and it, it will, you'll dry up that engine. You need oil. Our bodies need oil. You don't want too much oil. You don't want to be leaking. At the same point in time, you, we need oil. And we need wine too. 
We don't want to be so oiled like the ten, ten men. We, 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 need some, we need some wine too. We need some joy. We need the fruit of the Spirit. We need the life of God and the oil and wine overflowing. Because why? The harvest is ripe. And we can't reach the harvest without the oil and the wine. We need it. Okay? Joel 2.24 2, The threshing floor shall be full of wheat and the vash shall overflow with new wine and oil. I don't want yesterday's wine. I don't want yesterday's oil. How many of you know his mercies are new every morning? Great is his faithfulness. There's a newness to it. Every sunset is different. Every sunrise is new. Every day is, is new with no problems in it yet. You know, it, it, there's so much here. I want to close today's teaching with Psalm 23. I don't even know where I'm at with time. But I'm, I'm going to close here. So Psalm 23. I'm not going to read the whole psalm. There's six verses in it. Some of us can know, know this. Uh, obey him almost. But in verse 5 it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies and you anoint my head with oil and my cup, now that's the wine, runs over. I don't know about you, but that's very close to overflowing with new wine and over, overflowing my head with oil and my cup. You know, when, when they anointed people in the Old Testament, they didn't just do a little dab on the forehead. They pour that big puppy. I've seen Jack Haber. Some of you know who Jack Haber is. And when he anoints, he pours it in his hand, and they're just oily, sloppy. And he just anoints. I mean, he doesn't hold back anything. And I know we don't like the mess part, but I do like the analogy. I don't want just a dab with the Holy Spirit. Pour that puppy. <laughs> you know? I want all the Holy Spirit. I want my head to be overflowing with oil. And my cup runs over. The wine of his spirit. Okay. Oil and wine. Oil comes first. The oil it speaks to the cross. It speaks to Passover. The wine speaks of the Holy Ghost. Who speaks of Pentecost. Okay. Which we, we talked a lot about these in weeks before. Joel 2, 24 once again. The threshing floor shall be full of wheat. And the bats shall overflow with new wine and oil. Amen. Talk about the Holy Spirit. So like I said, we still have one, probably two, maybe even three weeks left, but I just don't, I just need to, I haven't determined that yet. But Lord, we worship you. Lord, teach us. I don't know how much of this we retain. But Lord, I want my vat overflowing with new wine and oil. I want the well of everlasting life, but I also want that river so I can reach my Jerusalem, my Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. When we never pride one over the other, we need the oil, but we need the wine. There's a world that needs Jesus. And Lord, anoint us. We were on that Jericho road. We were a mess up case. But you found us and you poured into us your oil and your wine. You brought us into your church. You gave us the Holy Spirit. And Lord, here to take care of us and to lead us into all truth until you come again. You're coming again. But while we're here, until you come again, we have a job to do. And we need the oil and we need the wine to be a witness to a world that needs the same oil and the same wine that we have. Teach us, use us, fill us. Some of us, we've been so wounded because of sickness, disease, being a victim, or we made a mess of our lives. But you also said, that you would restore to us the years that the locusts have eaten. And Lord, we thank you for the times of refreshing. We thank you for the place of rest. We might have made a drunkard of ourselves with all kinds of stuff. And it's time, it's time to get sobered up 
and it's time to receive the oil of salvation and the, the, the wine of your spirit, that we can be effective in these last days. It's time to stop playing victim. It's time to stop playing drunkard. And it's time to be sober. And it's time to come into your rest and refreshing. And to be a vessel of honor. Uh, and a, a, a vessel that can be used in these last days. So that many virgins can have their lamps filled with oil. When you, the bridegroom, comes again. In Jesus' name we give you thanks. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock. Amen and amen.